everyone welcome back to my channel true crime and felines for my subscribers thank you for your support i always appreciate it and if you're new here my name is brandy and every friday i will bring you a true crime case or mystery with one or more of my 14 felines this week's case takes place in the year 1931 and it's concerning a beautiful but troubled socialite a socialite for those of you who don't know is someone who is seen in various social activities like high society type things they are usually from like a wealthy or prominent family this particular socialite was named star faithful she would meet a tragic end at only 25 years old. But was it accidental or was it murder? So let's get started. Star Faithful was born Marion Star Wyman in 1906 in Illinois. Her parents were Frank and Helen Wyman. Frank was an investment banker and Helen was a socialite from the state of Massachusetts. Helen had a very prominent name and came from a very wealthy family of old money. However, her father sort of squandered the family wealth, so by the time she got married to Frank, there was no money left in her family, so all she had was her name to go on. Unfortunately for Helen, her husband Frank was just like her father. He just couldn't seem to hold on to the money he was making, and it put the family struggling for money a lot of the time. In 1910, the family ended up moving to New Jersey so Frank could get a better job still as an investment banker. And shortly after that, the family had another daughter named Elizabeth Tucker Wyman, who went by Tucker. So you can see they all went by their middle name here. She was born in 1911. Now around this time, some of these families were very, very, very close to their extended family, like cousins and uncles and aunts and such. So one of Star's cousins, her name was Martha, she ended up getting married to a man named Andrew James Peters. Now, Andrew James Peters was a well-known politician. If you were to Google him, that's what you're going to see, that he was the mayor of Boston and that he had a very good political career. Andrew was in the House of Representatives as the Assistant Secretary to the Treasury, and he served that during Woodrow Wilson's time as president. Like I said before, Andrew would go on to be the mayor of Boston, Massachusetts in 1918. So this man had a lot of power and influence due to his connections. So over the years, even though the Wymans lived in New Jersey and the Peters family lived in Massachusetts, the family spent a, very, a lot of time together. They would make many trips, be going Going to Massachusetts, Star would play with the Peters children and they just became very close. Now, it was stated later that the Wymans stayed in the Peters' good graces because Andrew was a little generous with his money. He would actually start giving the family money in loans or just gifts to help the family out. So, this help the Wymans stay out of poverty. The Peters also accepted both Star and Tucker into their family as if they were their own. So soon, Andrew started paying for both Star and Tucker's tuition at a high-scale boarding school in Boston. So the girls were staying at Andrew's home most of the year instead of staying in New Jersey with their parents. Now, when Star turned 11 years old, Andrew started paying specific attention to her. It would start out innocent enough where they would go on drives, just the two of them, but these drives started getting longer and longer. He'd then start taking Star on his many business trips around the United States that he'd take, and they would share a hotel room. 
Now, Star's parents saw nothing wrong with this behavior, but regardless, it was getting a little suspicious. Now, the marriage between Frank and Helen began to deteriorate, mostly because of the financial woes they were going through, and they ended up calling it quits in 1924 and getting divorced. In 1925, Helen would end up marrying inventor Stanley Faithful, who actually lived next door to her when she was married to Frank, so she didn't go far to find another man. Now, Stanley was an inventor, although he wasn't very good at it, and he didn't have a lot of money either. He also had many failed business ventures. However, Stanley apparently was really good at suing people and winning those cases. When he ran out of money, he would come up with some kind of lawsuit, win it, and get a windfall of money that he would quickly spend. So Helen apparently had a type. Helen and Stanley moved in together, and not long after they were married, the house fell into foreclosure. <laughs> God. They ended up moving then to New York in Greenwich Village and got an apartment there. The girls ended up taking Stanley's last name, and therefore that's how you got the name Star Faithful. Now, when Star entered her teenage years, her personality seemed to change. She began showing signs of depression. She was no longer that outgoing, happy girl that they knew. She became very withdrawn, and she would start wearing, like, baggy, boyish clothes to hide her figure. She would also not really do up her hair, and she always looked quite disheveled. Now, Star was a very cute kid, and she was growing into a very beautiful woman. So Helen got concerned that Star wanted to hide her femininity. When Star was 18, she was two months from graduation. Star ended up dropping out of the boarding school just because she was done, apparently. Her mother, Helen, became very concerned after that and actually committed her to a sanatorium in Massachusetts, and she was there for nine days. So while she was there, the doctors and the staff tried to figure out what was going on with her. Star ended up making up some fake relationship that had failed, and that's what she was depressed about, and seemed to then work to getting over this fictional boy. Star would then lie to the staff and say that her broken heart had been mended and then she was released from the sanatorium. Upon her release, one of the doctors stated to her parents that Star needed a change of scenery, so she should probably move back to New Jersey and start kind of over and be away from Massachusetts. So that's exactly what they did. But Helen and Stanley went one step farther. They sent her on a luxury cruise with her sister Tucker as just kind of a vacation. But this vacation lasted nine months. So the, both the sisters spent nine months at sea just being on their own with no parents, no chaperones. Tucker would state about her sister Star that although Star's behavior was a little erratic, she began drinking on this nine-month luxury cruise. Overall, Star was happy and Star seemed happier than she had been the last couple of years in Massachusetts. Star actually loved her life at sea and would talk non-stop about it. She wanted to live on a cruise line ship, apparently. She seized every opportunity to pretty much do whatever she wanted. So after nine months, Star and Tucker return home to New Jersey and they go to this apartment where Helen and Stanley are now staying, which is Star and Tucker's home as well. Stanley, happy that the family was all back together and and Star seemed happy, decided to pour the whole family some drinks to celebrate. So he poured four drinks, one for him, one for Helen, one for Tucker, and one for Star. When Stanley finished pouring the fourth drink, Star suddenly just downed all four drinks in front of them and just like a shot. Her family was a little shocked by this 
Tucker not so much, but they weren't aware of how bad Star's drinking habit had gotten. Star then, as the alcohol kind of got to her, she got a little belligerent, and her family was like, what is going on? I thought you were happy. I thought we were over this. What is your problem, pretty much, right? Star then would make the admission that would shock the whole family, and she finally stated in her drunken haze that from the age of 11... Andrew James Peters, the one that she stayed with in Massachusetts, he had been sexually abusing her. Help prove her point, she went to her room and she pulled out a book who, that was authored by Havelock Ellis, who at the time was, he specialized in human sexuality. And this book was given to her by Andrew to almost teach her how to have sex and what to expect when they had sex together. Star stated that, of course, she never wanted to have sex with Andrew, and he would make her sniff ether to sedate her. She would usually fall unconscious, and when she came to, Andrew was on top of her. As she got older, Andrew would not use ether and just pretty much assault her and, and make her. He'd rape her. And she said it had happened so recently that bef the day before she left Massachusetts for New Jersey, that was the last time that they had been together. Now, rather than inform the police that this had happened, Stanley saw this as yet an opportunity for financial gain. And apparently Helen went along with it. In 1927, Stanley and Helen confronted Andrew about this admission and blackmailed him. They told him to pay them the sum of money of $20,000 and the family would keep silent about the incident. Andrew just did it. This wasn't the only time that a great sum of money would come from Andrew over the years though because Helen and Stanley would continue going to Andrew over the next couple years and blackmail him again. In the end, it was reported that Andrew paid approximately $80,000 to Stanley and Helen for the supposed silence and blackmail, which would attribute to a, over a million dollars today. Andrew didn't, at the time, he really, he didn't confirm nor deny, but paying that amount of money with little protest or no protest is a little suspicious. So Stanley and Helen enjoyed their little financial windfall, but they did try to get help for Star. Star was sent to a psychiatrist, and now bear with me, yes, this is a licensed real psychiatrist, and this is his real advice. So the psychiatrist's advice was to hire a sex tutor. This was supposed to teach Star an appropriate healthy and proper relationship instead of the relationship that she had with Andrew. This was 1927 at the time and, you know, child abuse and child molestation wasn't a talked about thing in society, even though it was pretty prevalent as we know now. I mean, it wasn't until 1974 that Congress actually came out with the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act. So, Poor Star is a good 50 years away from protection as a child. At the time, this particular subject was kind of taboo to talk about and nobody really wanted to admit it was a problem. In society, the more prevalent subjects that they were talking about was they were more outraged that people were having sex before marriage and that women were entering the workplace. So I'm not saying this is right. I'm just trying to explain to you why this advice came from the psychiatrist the way it did. They just did not understand how this affects a victim. And the right treatment that Star actually needed hadn't been developed yet, unfortunately. They went out and got her a sex tutor. It was a uh, local man who actually was artist by trade, but they ended up having this sordid affair and Star would further deteriorate because, of course, the man was trying to act like he really loved her and everything, and he really didn't. And, you know, when you really don't love somebody, 
the other person knows. It's, you can see it. So Star began to continue to self-medicate by heavily drinking, and she would even occasionally inhale ether from what Andrew introduced her to, and she would overdose. She had a couple overdoses. In one particular instance, it happened in March of 1930. The police were called to Hotel St. Paul, room 48, where guests stated there was a lot of loud noises, yelling, and a lot of like bumps and like people being thrown against a wall, it sounded like. When the police got there, they went into the hotel room and they found a woman laying naked across the bed who was covered in bruises and cuts and scrapes. She was unconscious. She had a black eye. She had a fat lip. She was bleeding from the mouth. And on the floor sat a middle-aged man who was conscious. When they asked the man what was going on, he stated his name was Joseph Collins and the woman on the bed was his wife, Marie. They tried arousing Marie and they couldn't so they ended up loading her up and taking her to the hospital. They determined that she had acute alcohol poisoning and so they treated her for that. Once Marie awoke she admitted that she was in fact star faithful and she had no idea who that man was or what had happened. Star would continue on the spiral attending lavish parties in the New York, New Jersey high society, and she was becoming very well known for being very impulsive. She would regularly drink, use drugs, and pretty much have sex with anybody. During this time, Star still wanted to her life at sea. She loved being on those luxury liners. She knew that her parents were blackmailing Andrew. It was not a well-kept secret in the family. So she would then cause havoc with her parents and make them pay for cruises that she could go on with Andrew's hush money. And they would end up paying for eight of these. Now, when the funds would run out and the family would have to go back to Andrew to blackmail, there was, you know, a time when they didn't have any money to pay for these cruises. So what Star would do is she would hang around the piers and she would seduce the captains or crew members. They would take her aboard, take her to their room. They would usually have sex and then she would just stick on the boat as a stowaway as they launched off on the cruise. During one of these stowaway <laughs> cruises, Star got so drunk and so intoxicated that she actually suffered from alcohol poisoning. There was a surgeon on board the ship she was on working for the cruise liner, and his name was Dr. George Jameson Carr. He ended up pumping her stomach to save her life. When Star came to, she saw Dr. Jameson Carr as her angel, her lifesaver, and quickly became infatuated with him. Unfortunately, Dr. Jameson Carr did not reciprocate the feelings for Star. He was known as stating, you don't become romantic with a girl whom you used a stomach pump the first time you met her. However, that did not deter Star from going after Dr. Jameson Carr and her infatuation became on the obsessive side. Later, Star would sneak on to one of the cruise ships that Dr. Jameson Carr was working on and she broke into his stateroom and waited there for him. When Dr. Jameson Carr came into his room and saw Star there waiting for him, he immediately called security. Security removed her from the stateroom and then realized that she was a stowaway that did not have a ticket. So they actually had to escort her to a tugboat to take her back to the pier. As Star was being escorted off the ship, she became enraged. She was kicking and screaming and yelling and she blurted out, throw me overboard, just kill me. After a few days went by and Star sobered up, she ended up writing a letter to Dr. Jameson Carr apologizing for her behavior and just blamed it on being in a drunken state. 
This would not be the last time Starr would make a scene, however. On June 4th of 1931, Starr hailed a cab on the streets of New York and she wanted to go to another party. However, she could not find nor remember the address of this party and couldn't tell the cab driver where to go. The cab driver said he ended up dropping her off at an intersection where she eventually made her way home in the early morning hours. As she busted through the door of the apartment and woke the rest of the family, she bragged to them that she was at a party in Midtown New York with two actors named Bruce Winston and Jack Greenaway, and that she actually had to get to bed because she had plans with both of them the next morning. So the next morning, Star gets up, hungover, I'm sure, but she dresses in a black and white skin tight dress. She has her pearls on and her earrings and her gloves and her stockings and I mean she is dressed to the nines. As she's leaving the house, she tells her family that she's going to get her hair waved before she meets up with this Bruce and Jack and leaves the apartment. This is the last time her family would see her. Now that night, it, it was June 5th, Star didn't return home, so Stanley informed the police that she was a missing person. The police didn't take it too seriously because Star was well known to go on these drunken binges and they just kind of ignored it. Oh, she'll show up eventually. I'm sure she's just, you know, drunk. However, three days go by and there is no sign of Star, whether her family hasn't seen her, her friends haven't seen her, and there's been no public outbursts either or public scenes where people are overhearing where she's at. So Stanley pressures the police and was like, look, there's something's wrong here. Nobody has seen her. So the police decide that, yeah, they need to take it a little bit more serious. So they start asking around, starting with the last time Star was seen, and that was the night of June, or the early morning hours of June 4th. What they discover is that a Dr. Charles Young Roberts, what is with all the multiple names? Anyway, Dr. Roberts would tell the authorities that Star was with him the night of June 4th. Now that's the night that she said she was at a party in Midtown New York and, you know, living it up with two actors, Bruce and Jack, but that was a lie. Dr. Roberts stated that there was no party in Midtown that he was aware of and that Star was with him most of the night. As they had dinner, they went to a speakeasy and they ended up in a cab, drove around the city for a while and then ended up at a hotel. So now the police really had nothing to go on because she had lied about who she was with the night before. So what the authorities started doing is they kind of put it out in the papers of, hey, please come forward if you've seen this, you know, famous socialite star faithful. There was a cab driver that came forward and said, uh, yeah, I actually picked up star on the day of June 5th when she left the house dressed to the nines, that I picked her up about 1 p.m. at the Chelsea Piers. Now, the Chelsea Piers is where all the cruise ships kind of launch off. And what happens is, is before the cruise ship launches, they have this kind of launch party where everybody kind of celebrates and their families say goodbye. And then if you have a ticket, you stay on the boat. And if you don't have a ticket, you're supposed to get off. And, you know, this is how star would stay on these cruise ships. She would attend these parties and then, you know, not leave when she was supposed to leave. But this cab driver saying that he picked up star and a man at 1 p.m. at Chelsea Piers. The man and star got into the cab together and the man was dressed in like a captain's suit. So he assumed he was a captain of one of the ships and star kept calling him Brucey. Now the cab driver ended up dropping off Star in front of her apartment. As Star was getting out, she turned to Brucey and said, I will see you at 4 p.m. And Brucey replied, do not 
come back. The cab driver said Star slammed the door, stormed away from the cab, and they drove away. He didn't see Star go into the apartment. He just assumed she did. But obviously she didn't, otherwise her family would have saw her. So he said he drove Brucey back to Chelsea Piers, where Brucey paid the man and all was well. Consequently, about an hour later, so this would be about 2 p.m., the cab driver went back to Chelsea Piers to look for a fare. And who's hailing a cab? Well, it's Brucey, and who is on his arm? It's Star again. So apparently Star ended up probably hailed a cab and went back to the Chelsea Piers right away and found Brucey. Now the cab driver stated that by then that Star seemed very drunk. Brucey literally shoved Star in the back seat of the cab, told the cab driver, take her home and do not bring her back. So the cab driver drove away with just Star in the back. Now, during the drive, Star realized she didn't have enough money for the fare and Brucey didn't pay for the fare either. So the cab driver ended up saying that he had to drop her off halfway in between her home and Chelsea Piers. He said when she got out, she seemed to walk in the direction of going back to Chelsea Piers again. Now, authorities were then able to talk to a salon at the Grand Central Station and stated that Star had come in and tried to book an appointment for 3 p.m. When they stated that no appointment was available, she walked away towards Chelsea Piers again. Now remember Dr. Charles Young Roberts? <laughs> well, he came forward after uh, authorities were asking people if they knew anything about Star, and he stated that he was working at Chelsea Piers and he saw Star about 4 p.m. She saw him and approached him and they ended up hanging out. They had dinner from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m., he stated. He then stated that Star was so drunk or intoxicated that she was not good company and he really didn't want to continue spending time with her that night. So he ended up putting in her in a cab and told her to go home. However, he said that before he closed the door, she told the cab driver to take her to another party, but he did not catch the address. And that is the last time that Star was supposedly seen that night. Now, police first tried to track down this Brucey. They looked for a Bruce Winston, and they did find an actor named Bruce Winston, but he was British and lived in London, and he was elderly, and he had really no connection of being in New York at the, t at the time of her disappearance. So that couldn't have been it. They found some other people that either their first name was Bruce or their last name was Bruce, but they could not make a connection with that either. They never found a captain of a ship named Brucey either. The leads fizzled out and they lost track of what happened to her when she got in that cab and they couldn't find the cab driver who drove her. Now, during this time that Star was missing, Stanley and Helen would reach out to Andrew Peters and they informed him that she was missing, but they also tried to extort more money from him. This time he refused. Now on the morning of June 8th, 1931, a man was scavenging for trinkets along Long Beach and he spotted a body in the sand and sort of in the water. She had dried sand and seaweed in her hair. She was wearing a black and white fitted dress, but there was nothing underneath. So her underwear was not there. She was battered and bruised. So the speechcomber calls the authorities. The authorities tell Stanley and Stanley comes down to look at the body and he does positively identify it as Star. So they go through an autopsy with Star and they put her death as officially as drowning that she had a lot of seawater in her lungs. Authorities would state that she either fell or jumped from one of the cruise ships that she frequented and that's what led to her demise. 
and then she eventually washed up on shore. However, Stanley did not believe that his stepdaughter would commit suicide, and she also was a really strong swimmer because she used to teach swimming classes or be a, a lifeguard, one of the two, as a teenager. So he just didn't believe this theory. So he pushed the issue and a second autopsy was done on Star and a more thorough one. The first autopsy, again, the police were kind of biased and they were just like, yeah, she got drunk and fell. End of story, right? Case closed. But this time a, another doctor and did a proper full autopsy on Star. Along with the seawater in her lungs, they also found a lot of sand. So what this indicated is that Star drowned in shallow water and she likely did not fall or jump from a cruise ship in deeper water because by the time she washed up on shore, she would have been dead. There was abrasions on her face and the doctor said this could ended up as like a struggle where somebody was holding her face down into the sand. So the sand was in the debris in the water was scratching up her face because they were holding her down so hard to drown her. And then finally they ran like a toxology report or you know on her liver and they discovered that Star had not ingested alcohol for over 36 hours prior to her death. So this means that the last time she drank any alcohol would have been supposedly the night of June 4th when she was with Dr. Charles Young Roberts that first time and that she didn't drink at all on June 5th. They did, however, find a barbiturate in her system called Veronal, which is a sedative and that she also had sex shortly before her death. Now, whether it was an assault or consensual, they weren't quite sure. When it was put in the paper that Star was found and that she was in fact deceased, there was an informant that came forward and said that they saw a woman resembling Star on June 6th arguing with a man at the Tappy Motel, which apparently the Tappy Motel was known to be like a criminal mobster gangster type place. If that was true, that means that Star did not die the night of June 5th. As Stanley was working with the authorities on this, he told authorities and anybody involved to please not go to the press about this. He wanted to kind of keep it all silent. Stanley then attempted to extort Andrew again for more money, and again, Andrew stated he was not going to do it this time. Now knowing that Star was dead, I'm sure he's like, what do I have to lose? So, not even a couple hours after Stanley left the police department, he went straight to the press and told them everything about Star and, and her accusation about Andrew. He went on to say that he believes that Andrew either hired somebody to kill her or Andrew was connected with some shady mobsters and the mobsters wanted to blackmail Andrew, so they found out what he did to Star, so they found Star, <laughs> it gets a little confusing, they found Star and was interrogating her to get information out of her so they could use that information to blackmail him and they just got carried away and ended up killing her. So that's, that's what Stanley thinks happened. Now although this pointed to murder, it also pointed to suicide and that's what makes this so hard. That doctor on the cruise ship that Star was obsessed with, the Dr. Jameson Carr, he had received three letters from Star shortly before she died and he brought those in to show police. In those letters, she kind of poured her heart out and expressed that she wished to end her existence, but she didn't want to end it in a way where she's maimed or deformed, so like jumping out a window isn't an answer that she wanted to go still pretty, so drowning would make sense. And some say this points to the exact fact that she sedated herself with that drug and jumped off and jumped overboard off a cruise ship and just fell asleep at sea. 
The other two laters also go into detail of how she is feeling suicidal and how she was kind of at peace with it and she was ready to leave this earth. Now here comes Stanley again. Stanley stated that these letters were not from Star and they were forgeries from the murderer to try to cover their tracks. Stanley would end up hiring a handwriting expert who agreed that the handwriting did not match Star's handwriting but then some others say that he paid the handwriting expert off to say that. So who knows? Police would disagree with this handwriting expert's opinion and they just kind of dismiss Stanley's claim. Authorities had asked Stanley and Helen if Star kept like a diary, because that was a big thing back then is to keep diaries. And Stanley and Helen, well, Helen said she didn't think so. And then Stanley first said no. And then he said, well, she did, but I threw it out. When authorities searched the apartment, they found a memory book, which essentially is a diary. So Stanley lied about that for some reason. There were several entries in this book about her sexapades with at least 19 men. There was a couple entries with the initials AJP, which probably was Andrew James Peters. One entry which she said happened right before she left Massachusetts. It was dated that and said that she spent the night with AJP. Oh, the horror, horror, horror. So the authorities, you know, took copies of all this stuff and the original diary then was given back to Stanley. And Stanley went straight to the press with the diary and allowed them to print whatever they wanted. But pretty much Star's whole diary was put out there for the whole world to see. In October of 1931, the authorities announced that Starr's case was virtually closed and that her death was officially a misadventure, meaning that it was suicide. Stated that she took a sedative and jumped off a ship and drowned. Now, the district attorney at the time did believe that Starr did not commit suicide, that she was actually murdered but he admitted he just didn't have enough evidence to move forward with it. So he had no choice but to go along with what the authorities were saying. Andrew James Peters, he was never officially charged with anything and he adamantly denied that he never did anything to star. However, his reputation did suffer after that and he had numerous breakdowns. However, he continued his career in politics. He ended up passing away in 1938 of pneumonia. Now the reaction to Starr's death was pretty surprising in some areas. Even though Starr was known to cause scenes and be drunken and impulsive, she was still popular and people loved her. However, her own sister Tucker stated she was not sorry that Starr was dead, that everyone was happier and Starr was happier as well. Good old Stanley uh, did not stop with his lawsuits. He actually tried to sue the Globe for libel, but that case was dismissed. So that was one lawsuit that he did not get money for. Star's remains were cremated, and unfortunately, nobody stepped forward to claim them. Stanley and Helen stated that when they wanted to claim them, they didn't have the money to pay for them. So. It's just a sad story overall. So what are your thoughts on this case? Do you think Star was murdered? Did she die by an accident? Or did she commit suicide? My heart goes out to her because what happened to her and the trauma she suffered, unfortunately, was in a time when the right treatment, the right support was just not there for her. So she suffered her entire life because of what Andrew did to her. It could have been completely different life for her if Andrew wasn't such a sleazeball. I'd love to hear what you think in the comments down below. Please don't forget to subscribe if you like my stories in this channel. And I will be back next Friday with another true crime case or mystery. Thanks guys. Bye.